Good morning, everyone. I'm realizing that maybe the clock out in the lobby is set like a minute or so later than the one in here, because apparently I'm a couple minutes late getting up here. But good morning. Glad to see you all. Glad that everybody was enjoying the fellowship so much. Did it say that it's time to get started? Let's start with number 400. My, sorry, but my throat is feeling a bit dry after class, so I'll do what I can. Oh,
Our God and Father, we're so thankful for the day you have given us to live. We're thankful for life itself. We ask that you be with those of our number who are sick or injured or have been hospitalized. We just ask that you bless them and heal their bodies and help them return to us soon, if that is your will. We ask, too, that you be with those of our number that either are traveling or are about to be traveling. Give them safety in their travels. You know, many are many miles from home, and we look forward to their return. We just ask, Father, that you help them, that uh, they will have safety on the highways and in the air as they travel during this holiday season. And help us to remember your Son, Jesus, at all times and in all, all things, all ways. Help us that we might remember his suffering that he went through for us. We know you love us. You care about us. We're thankful, Father, for our families and friends. And I ask that you bless us, especially during this holiday season. And uh, help us that we might be an encouragement to one another always. Thank you for each one that made the effort to be here today. Help us that we might be ever mindful of the blessings that you give to us.
another contribution listing number one once we get these I think. Before the lesson, is song number 128. Take my life and let it be consecrated unto thee. Take my life and let it be
scripture reading comes from the book of James, the chapter is 1, and the verses are 16 through 18. And your Bible reads, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. But his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Good morning. Good to see everyone here. Uh, as you know, this time in our, our culture is a time when the world is thinking about the, the birth of Christ. And really, every Sunday is an opportunity that we think about the birth of Christ and we thank God for his death and, most importantly, for his resurrection. So this morning, I want to take an aspect of what our culture is thinking about right now and something that we will be engaging in either tonight or tomorrow. I don't know if your family falls within the, the Christmas Eve opening up of gifts or the Christmas Day. I know those are two kind of different camps, but it's typically a time when we give. So I want us to look at our giving Father. And so there's a quote that I found that, that I think is important since we're introducing this sermon you can give without love, but you cannot love without giving. A quote comes from a missionary. No one exemplifies giving better than our Heavenly Father. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one verse from the book of James and look at some of the aspects of our giving Father and then make the application to us and how you and I should give. And so throughout this lesson, as we talk about giving, I don't want us to merely think about monetary giving. Sometimes when we say giving, we think of money, but a Christian may give in a lot of different areas. We may give in our time, our resources, such as clothing or food. And we also may give of prayers as we labor with one another in our prayers to God. And you and I should be imitators of God. Ephesians 5 1 says, Therefore be thou imitators of God as dear so let's look to our Father and think about how we can exemplify Him, or how we can take His example and run with it. We're going to see, number one, that God gives. That God gives liberally, and that God gives without reproach. So Ephesians 5.1, as we imitate God. The first point that I want us to go over is, let's look at how God wants to give. We look at verse number 5 of James chapter 1. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it shall be given to him. In the context of this verse, it's talking about asking God for wisdom. However, there's an aspect of God that is shown in this verse that we can pull out and understand better his giving nature. And so the picture here that we see is that God is waiting to give us what we ask for. But we should not confuse that as some type of a, a Santa Claus image. As we put in our request, and if we're good, we, we get what we have requested. Because God does not give us all that we want. But we do have an assurance that he gives us good things. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. The text will be small on the screen. You may want to turn there. Matthew chapter 7, as we think about how God gives us good things. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know, not, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And you and I can be assured that we will receive good things from God. And do you know what the mark of our assurance is that we will receive good things. It's actually the very Son of God. If we go over to Romans chapter 8, verse 32, here's the guarantee that we will receive good things from God. It says, He who, that is God, did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so the fact that God gave us the best through his Son you and I are assured that he will also give us all things freely because he's given us 
confessed already. I guarantee you. But we have to think about why did God give us His Son? A very popular verse we all know, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But I want to go a little bit further and think about what condition was the world in before God the Father sent His Son? Let's think about that. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God wants to give us things. Specifically, He wants to give us good things. He wants to give us good things because He loves us. But He also loved us when we were at our most unlovable. And so as God is a giver, so should we be. But it's very easy for us to give out of an obligation. Let's think about that for a moment. Has anyone ever sat down, especially around the Christmas holiday season, and thought about who has given them gifts the previous year, right? Because if you think about who gave you gifts last year, that means you have an obligation to what? Give them a gift this year, right? So you think about, did so-and-so send a gift? Okay, what was the gift? Was the gift, was it like a coffee mug? Was it like a gift card? Like how much was the gift card? And you think about reciprocity, right? And you think, oh, well, I need to give a gift because they gave me a gift. Let's give one of comparable value just to kind of maintain the status quo. That's giving out of an obligation, but that's not giving out of an opportunity to give. And that's how our Heavenly Father gives. Because remember, God gave us His Son while we were still sinners in opposition to God. Did God have to give us His Son? Did God have to give us anything? No. God gave because He loved us and He had the ability to. He had the opportunity and He took it. So let's think about the difference between giving as an obligation and giving as an opportunity. Here are some examples of giving as an opportunity allows. The first is opening our homes to entertain a stranger. Now when I say stranger, I'm not meaning some homeless person that's off the street. What I mean by a stranger is someone who is not a member of that household. When we allow someone into our house and we open it up for them, we see an opportunity. Another example is maybe giving a card or making a call to an individual who may may view us as an enemy, may view that we there's some opposition in the relationship. Another example would be perhaps you're standing in line and the person behind you, maybe you have the opportunity to give them your place in line. Perhaps they have left. Perhaps it's a pregnant mother, right? You have an opportunity to give to them. And you know what the stranger, the individual in the line, and the enemy all have in common? There's not necessarily an obligation for us to do anything for them, but there is an opportunity. And as God has given out of opportunity, not obligation, you and I should give as the opportunity arises. Galatians 6.10 addresses this specifically. Therefore, as we have opportunity. As the situation presents itself, let us do good to all. That's not just the, the people that we like or the people in our household or the people in the local congregation. All men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's look at how God treats his enemies and how he treats the unthankful and the unkind. And as we see how he treats them, that should be our marching order for how we should treat all people. Go to Luke chapter 6 and verse 35. Christ instructs those who are listening, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. That's how you and I should be. What would the world look like? and I imitated God in this way. As we're looking at this holiday season, the world is full of a lot of anxious and very busy people. You and I have an opportunity to be different in the midst of this season. What if, no matter what they have given to us, we exchange what they've given to us with kindness? Here's an example. Uh, many people eat out during the holiday season just so they don't have to cook and go out with family and friends. So let's say that your waiter or waitress seems 
frazzled, not doing a very good job, is just kind of busy with the holiday season, probably because there's more people eating out. What if you, as a Christian, ask them, hey, we're about to have a prayer for our food. Is there anything that we can pray for you? Is there any way that we can help you? Are you doing all right? You and I can make a difference by being kind to people who are unthankful or who may be irritable. If we make a difference, then we can be a difference to someone by standing out. So God is a giver, but God is also one who gives abundantly. Let's continue on in James chapter 1 and verse 5. If if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally. To give liberally means without reservation. It means that there's no limit. There's no time where God says, you've reached your quota for your life. Uh, Everything else, you know, you're not going to get. There's never an end to the giving of God. God is not, as we would say, stingy with the things that he gives. But did you know that there's actually a way that you or I may limit what God can give to us? God wants to give. He wants to give abundantly. But there are some reasons that God may not be able to give as he would like. One of the reasons why God may not give us as he would like is your and I lack of obedience. Let's go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Malachi. Here, God wants to bless his people, but there's something that's holding him back. It's actually their lack of obedience and giving. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? The answer is, in tithes and offerings. They were not obedient to the law of Moses. You are cursed with a curse, as God had warned them. If they would not be obedient, there were curses that would come upon them and their land. For you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Simply be obedient, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this. Listen to this next part. Says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. God wanted to give them more than they could possibly imagine, but he was held back because they wouldn't obey. It's one of the reasons why we may be limiting our God from giving as he would like for our lack of obedience. The next is also our lack of faith. If we look at the following two verses of the verse that we're looking at this sermon, verses 6 and 7 of James chapter 1, we'll see that our lack of faith could prevent God from giving as he would like. So as the one who, who comes to, to God, uh, that was verses uh, 10. So James 1, 6 and 7. But let him ask in faith, the one who's asking of God for wisdom, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. The one who asks God for things, but really doubts whether or not God will deliver, or whether or not God is faithful, will not receive anything of the Lord. He's not asking in faith. Another reason why God may not be able to give as he would like to us is because of our improper motives. James 4, verse 3 says, You ask, and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And so the reason they ask is not for service or to help them or to help other people, but out of selfish reasons. I just want more. I want to be comfortable. For that, God may not answer that prayer. But then lastly, there are things we may ask that is simply not within God's will. First John 5, 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And the next verse goes on to say we can be certain that we will gather. To summarize, from all those verses we looked at, sometimes we don't receive the liberal giving that God would give simply because it would do us more harm than good. We're not in a place where God can bless us as he would like. When I was in Alaska, I think I've used this illustration before, but it always comes to my mind as I'm thinking about how God would love to give and sometimes how we cannot receive it. Now, there's a family who adopted me while I was in Alaska. I was still a single man at the time. And they uh, they had two boys. And so 
we would typically on Wednesday nights after Bible study, we'd go and get ice cream. Uh, ice cream was, was really great. I don't remember what all was going on with the ice cream, but it was something that was made from honey. It tasted extraordinary. But it was even better because the boys loved going. They had like coloring things and they would play. And it was just fun to see them so excited. It was a very enjoyable experience uh, for their family and also for me tagging along. But there was one evening where the boys were absolute brats. They were not listening to their parents. They did not earn the right to go and get ice cream with their family. And so as a result, the parents were not able to give what they would love to give to their children because they didn't want to increase that problem behavior. And so they were not able to receive it. So we have to acknowledge that God wants to give us so much. But sometimes we're not in a position that He can give to us. And just as God cannot always give to us liberally as He wishes, sometimes we cannot give as liberally as we would like. Here are some instances in which we may not be able to give as we want. Consider the gift of time. There are some relationships in our life that we may desire to give more time to that relationship. However, maybe that friendship is one that leads me further away from God. I may want to give of my time, but I can't I can't handle that relationship. And so we have to not give our time as liberally in that situation. Any family who has gone through difficulty of having a child who's gone into drug addiction. As a parent, you may want to give them liberally, to give them all that they would wish or ask for, but you can't because of where they're at in their life. I mean, you know that it will do them more harm than good. So sometimes we do have to hold ourselves back. But when we do give, we should give as our God gives, liberally, without a limit. And I love the fact that as as we think about not only our resources, but also money, I love that the Bible in the New Testament never gives us an amount for how much we're supposed to give. I love that. Because it's like, guys, the limit. Test God. And so, let's go to 2 Corinthians 9, 7 as we're thinking about giving. And giving liberally. We're instructed to give as each one has purpose in his heart. Not grudgingly or necessity, so not out of obligation. I have to but I get to give. For God loves a cheerful giver. The irony is that so often when we think about giving, we think we're sacrificing. Oh, I have to sacrifice this great amount that I'm giving. But the faithful Christian realizes that you can't outgive God. The more you give, the more God will give to you. It's an assurance. Acts 20, verse 35 Paul records that some of the words of Christ says that it's more blessed to give than to receive. In giving, you will be blessed. Because as we give, we open the door to God for God to bless us. So God has, as uh, last week we considered that God comforts us so that we can comfort each other with that same comfort that He has comforted us. This week in this sermon, we realize that God gives to us so that we may give to others. That's the purpose of his giving. So let's look at that as we think about money from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. This is a commandment to those who are rich in this present age. You can turn there if you would like. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Paul instructs Timothy to command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good work, ready to give, willing to share. So God blesses them so that they can enjoy what God has blessed them with, but they need to be willing to share and ready to give, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. When God blesses us with riches, we need to keep our eyes open for opportunities to give and to bless others. But not only that, let's think about the talent, the abilities God has blessed each of us with. God has given those to us so that we can use them for others. Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry, or service, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts, encourages, and exhortation, 
He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So preparing for this sermon, there was an illustration of three different types of givers. And it kind of stuck out to me. So givers can be divided into three types. On your y'all's left, that's uh, Flint, like two stones making it apart. Some givers can be like Flint. You to get anything out of them, you have to hammer the flint. And even then, you only get chips and sparks. Some givers can be like a sponge, in which it wrings them out to get every single last bit. But the more you want, the more you're going to have to wring and force it out. There are some givers who are like that honeycomb, in which it overflows with sweetness. As God has freely given to us, we should freely give to others. That is what God does. That is how God would have us to give. So, God gives, God gives liberally, but God also gives without resentment. Let's look at verse number 5. It says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. The word for reproach means to revile or to rail at. Now listen to this phrase. It means to cast favors received in one piece. Overall, it's a negative attitude toward the one who receives the gift. So let's look at an example of how God freely gives, but he does not resent us depending upon how we view, uh, how we use his gift. So let's go back all the way to 2 Chronicles. This will be a six-verse reading. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 7 through 13. God is going to give the desires of the heart of Solomon. To give them very rich, uh, rich gifts. So let's begin reading in verse number seven. On that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord, let your promise to David my father be established. For you have made me a king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now, give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. So his desire was not selfish, but rather to serve in the position God had given him. For who can judge this great people of yours? Then God said to Solomon, Because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked for a long life. It's kind of the typical wishes. You know, if you had three wishes, there are probably some that would be on our wish list. But you've asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor. So see again, here's a perfect example of God giving abundantly to Solomon. Such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. Here's the question. Did Solomon always use the gifts that God has given him wisely? He squandered them. He multiplied to himself wives who turned his heart to false gods. But you know what? Although God never approved of all of Solomon's behavior, God never resented Solomon. The door was always open for him to come back to God. No matter how you and I may squander the gifts that God has given to us in this life, God never resents us for how we have treated them. Case in point, I want us to take a few uh, snippets of the verses from the account of the prodigal son. Let's look at what the prodigal son did with the gift from his father. Well, first off, in verse number 12 of Luke 15, he goes and he asks his father for the portion of goods that falls to him. He's acting already as if his father is dead. He says, give me my inheritance now. So what does he do with that inheritance? Well, we're told in the very next verse. It says that he wasted his possession with prodigal living. He took all the things that were owed him and he wasted it. He spent it on who knows what. His brother thought that it was on basically prostitutes and a good time. And after all was said and done, and he lost what his father had given him, he was ashamed. He 
said this in verse 19, as he was rehearsing what he would tell his father. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And you know how his father responded to him? In an unresentful way. Verse 24, he said, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. The door back to our Heavenly Father is always open. No matter how you have wasted your life, no matter how you've wasted your ability, no matter how many relationships you have ruined that God has given to you, you can always make it back to God. Have you ever resented someone for how much you've given them? This is actually a very common problem in marriages. Typically in a marriage, there is one person who is more of a giver and one person who is typically not as giving as the other. So it may be that one or the other tells the other person, I give and I give and I give, and you don't give back to me. The problem there is that the giver was giving with resentment, with reproach, casting back what they had given the other spouse. And the problem with the, the other spouse is that they were not showing appreciation for all that the other spouse was giving. God does not treat us this way. God will never throw it back in our teeth all the blessings He's given us, even if we squander them. So what can I do as I learn from this aspect of our giving God who gives without reproach? The reality is, is that some people may take advantage of our giving. And no one knows that better than God. The reason why James says that God gives without reproach is that should never be a barrier for us going back to God and asking Him for more. We never have to worry when I bow down on my knees and I ask God for the things that I need. I never have to worry about Him saying, I've already given you so much. God never resents us for what He's done for all, all that He has given us. I need to treat, I need to view my giving in that same way. You see, resentment can build a barrier in our relationship. You think of a, a parent to a child who has hurt them. Resentment grows because the parent thinks, I not only gave you life, I gave you a home, I gave you clothes, I gave you instruction, I gave you patience, I gave you all of these things, and you squandered it. And you know what that does? It builds resentment. It builds a barrier so that those people who maybe need to make things right can never come to that person. It's not that way with God. It should never be that way with us. If any of us are harboring feelings of resentment to people that we've given so much to, I know it's hard, but it just has to go away. We have to get rid of the wall of resentment. Because if anyone has a case for resentment, it's God against the world. And if our giving God gives without reproach, we should as well. So this holiday season, as we're thinking about giving gifts, Let's look to the example of our Father, who not only has given us and wants to give us, but He gives us literally without reproach or casting it in our teeth. And as we think about all that God has given to us, there's no greater gift than that of salvation. God gave us His Son. But it's up to us whether or not we will accept what He has given to us. The reality is that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and 23. The reality is that God wants all men everywhere, regardless of what they have done or are doing. He wants them to come to His Son. First Timothy 2 and 4, He wants all to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that invitation is for all who will be willing to hear the Word of God, those who will, are willing to believe the Word of God, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and that He died on the cross. You are willing to repent of your sins and confess that Jesus Christ Lord, and if you're willing to be baptized for the remission of your sins, as we saw those on the day of Pentecost did in Acts chapter 2, if you want to make the decision this morning, the invitation is open. Well, what may be more likely is that you are a Christian sitting in the pews and you've looked at your giving and the way that you present yourself and as you give to others, maybe you realize you've come up short and there are things that you need to make right in your life. As we discussed in James this morning, you may need the prayers of your brothers and sisters. And if we can pray for you and encourage you, we want to do that at this time. As together we stand and together we sing.
Righteous Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us, for blessing us. We thank you for giving us Jesus to live and to die for us and to save us from our sins. We pray, Father, that you help us to likewise give of ourselves to others. Bless those who are traveling over the holidays with safety and travel. We ask that you uh, continue to bless Judy and Shelley and their healing. We pray that you bless Anna with the safe birth and a healthy baby. For this is our prayer. 